and that would mean Ragnick until May moving upstairs, changing the structure inside Manchester United's board because a footballing man would be in there. That would be incredible. Would the Glazers do that? Question marks, question marks. But it would seem very smart. And then you've laid the carpet out for Ten Hag. That video from back in November was me saying that in an ideal world, on paper, I think the idea of Ralph Randnick coming in as an interim manager, followed by Eric Ten Hag in the summer, would be an excellent bit of short and long-term planning by United. Now, Ralph Radnick, he came in, and I personally think he's been good for the club. I still absolutely stand by the fact that if he is given power in that consultancy role, he can make a lot of difference to Manchester United. And for me, in this video, I want to explain exactly why I still stand by what I said back in November, that Eric Ten Hag would be the perfect new long-term manager for Manchester United. In this video, I want to explain exactly why, and there's one key characteristic that I really want to focus on. That's what I'm going to do in this video. Please, if you would consider subscribing, go down there, hit that subscribe button if you did enjoy the video by the end of it, and hit the notification bell as well. You get a ping every time I go live with a video. But as I said, for me, there's one key, because I think on paper, if you compare Eric Ten Hag and Mauricio Pochettino, I feel there's a lot of similarities between the two. You can say a pro of Poch is his Premier League experience and a negative of Ten Hag is the fact that he hasn't done it in the Premier League. But there's pros and cons to either of them. But for me, there's one key characteristic to Ten Hag's management at Ajax, which for me stands out. So let's rewind to 2018-19 and that Ajax team there. That team that got to the Champions League semi-final and was one, they were one kick away from getting to the final. Probably would, probably would have lost to Liverpool, uh, realistically. But... It was such a great team with Delict coming through. You've got De Jong there. You've got Ziyech. You've got Neres. You've got the oh, you've got Van der Beek. You've got it's just a fantastic team which worked brilliantly. But that team got taken apart, and despite that, Eric Ten Hag this season went unbeaten in the group stage in the Champions League. Yes, they got knocked out to Benfica. Ultimately, they fell short in the round of 16. But I want to show you how this process of rebuilding, for me, is the most significant thing that Ten Hag has done and the comparisons that I can draw that show me that that really makes him a really top-level manager. So that team there in 2018-19, if we were to look at what happened in the following summer, look at those departures. De Jong to Barcelona for 77 million. De Ligt to Juventus for 77 million. Dolberg left as well. So if I was to go down here, look, he's, he's, now, he's now been sold and he's now been sold. Two players out of that team which are now gone. Dolberg wasn't involved in that starting 11 there. This is, by the way, this was a starting 11 against Real Madrid uh, when they won away at Santiago Bernabeu. And Dolberg wasn't involved in that, but he started the game against Spurs in the semi-final. So you can involve Dolberg in this situation in terms of starting 11 players. And if we fast forward the year after, look, we've got Hakim ZX going to Chelsea, 36, and of course, Van der Beek going to Manchester United. So that's another two of those starters from that team that are leaving. And I've actually forgotten one down here. So if I scroll back down here, Lasse Schoener, he left as well. And he started in midfield alongside De Jong in this game against Real Madrid. So in two seasons, you've got five players there who have left from that starting 11. If we fast forward one more year up here, then you see another one leaving. That is David Neres. So he leaves as well. So that's six players who have left from that team in 2018-19. That is a significant amount of players. This is a significant amount of change. And it doesn't just stop right there, because if we were to fast forward now, and if we were to look at the starting 11 from Ajax's game against Benfica in their most recent match, you can see that Tagliafico, he's not starting in that team either. So if we were to take him out, you would look here and see in the process of three years that there were only four starters Actually, no, three starters. I can't remember what his name is. Is that, is that, is that Masrawi? I can't remember whether that's Masrawi or not. Um, but Tadic, Blind. No, that's not Masrawi. It might be. I think it is, actually. Uh, <laughs> I've confused myself there. There's too many players here. Uh, Daily Blind, Anana, <clears throat> and Tadic. Going down here and looking at the starting 11 that they had here, only three years later. And as I said, for me, this is the most impressive thing, right? Because look at all the talent that's left. Delict. De Jong. Ziyech, Van der Beek. That, that's, that's enough talent leaving a club to really kill any momentum that a manager might have. But instead of being killed by it, it was just a process of rebuilding. And 
he's done it fantastically well. So look at that there. You've got Masrawi who's come through the Ajax Academy system, just like Timber has and just like Gravenberch has. Obviously, that's been supplemented by the likes of signing Anthony from, I think, Sao Paulo. Uh, Stefan Berghaus, who's sort of the experience in the middle. And Sebastian Haller, who came, of course, from West Ham and became their new target man when Dolberg left. It, for me, it's that ability that Ten Hag has shown to rebuild this Ajax team from that team there that was, that was so exciting, so fantastic to watch to this team here who went undefeated in the group stage of the Champions League. Of course, they fell short when it came to the round 16, but it shouldn't take away from the impressiveness of that rebuild. And that, for me, is the key characteristic that I think separates Ten Hag from Poch. Because going back to Fergie, right? And I think this is why I have this feeling about Ten Hag. Fergie was an incredible manager in his own right. But for me, one of the, again, one of the standout characteristics of Fergie, what made him so incredible and what gave him such a long career at Manchester United was his ability to rebuild and regenerate. And for me, he did that three key times at Manchester United, starting from when he came in in, in, in the late 80s to the team that he built there to win the Premier League in 1992, 90, 90, sorry, 93. You can't even see him over here. Cantona over there, Schmeichel. You've got Lee Sharp, Bruce, Hughes, Ince, Parker, Pallister. Robson, Kanchelskis up there, Irwin, Giggs, McClare, Neville over there hiding in the background. It was an incredible team that Fergie built there. And if we were to fast forward six years, he did the same thing again when it comes to like 99. And the team that he built there that I don't need to tell you about the players that are in that team. You know about that season. It, it will always be the most historic season that Manchester United have ever had. But twice, once... In 1993, from the fight that Fergie did when he came in to that Premier League winning team, for me, that was the first proper Fergie team that, that he built. And then fast forward in a few years to 99, after competing with uh, Arsenal when they came in and won the double, I think the year before. And then Fergie built that team in 99 and we won the treble. And then between 99 and what I would say is his third installment of this Fergie team. And that's that team from 2007-8. When, of course, we had Ronaldo, we had Carrick, we had Nani, we had Anderson, Ferdinand, oh, Vidic, O'Shea, Van der Sar, Piquet's even there holding the background, Rooney, Tevez. And that was after Mourinho came in and it looked like Fergie had been sort of knocked down. The, the, the Chelsea dominance had come in, but instead of like bowing down to it, Fergie rebuilt a team again. So three times, in my opinion, that Fergie has sort of done that. There in 93... 99 and in 2008, three best examples of it. And I and I think what, what he did here at Ajax between 2018-19 and 2021-22, of course, it doesn't compare because, you know, the Premier League <laughs> and winning the Champions League, very, very different things to, you know, winning the Eredivisie and, and doing it inside the Ajax system. But limited resources by comparison and the big focus there as well is on the academy. And again, if I'm going to link that to Manchester United now, right now, Man United have got a crop of youngsters coming through, which I think is the best crop we've had in some time. You know, Man United, we, we really have not been successful by our own measures, by, and our own measures are Premier League and Champions League. You know, some clubs would be delighted at winning the Europa League and, and a League Cup and an FA Cup, but it's just not the measure of success at United, and it never will be because we won the Champions League and the Premier League. But our squad that we've got right now, in terms of the younger teams, we're in our first FA Youth Cup final since 2011. Of course, we know that Hannibal Medjury is coming through, but it's not just Hannibal Medjury. You can look at Alejandro Ganacho, he's a real star. He's already in the Argentina senior setup, and he hasn't played a senior game for Manchester United. Here, pictured training with Messi. Fantastic player. You look at Charlie McNeil, a proper goal scorer. Absolutely lethal strike. And we've had plenty of those who have come through. Will Keane will be one that comes to mind. James Wilson will be another one. And not all of them make it. But Charlie McNeil, he looks a bit special. And I would say Alvaro, is it Alvaro? It's Fernandez, the left back that we've signed. He definitely looks a bit a cut above. There's, there's a lot of these younger players that we have brought through that on paper have all the talent to break through. And if we're being honest, we could probably do some competition at left back. There's a spot there I think that could be taken. We definitely need a striker to come through. Charlie McNeil, the opportunity seems there. When it comes to Garnacho, when it comes to Hannibal Medjbury, maybe that's a part of the pitch where we're a bit 
spoilt for choice. We do have some real quality in the attacking midfield positions. But seeing what Ten Hag did there in not only rebuilding, but rebuilding with Masraoui, rebuilding with Timber, rebuilding with Graven Birch, three academy players that came through the Ajax system, and they, were, and they were supplemented by smart, good signings. Anthony, an excellent signing. Berghaus and Haller, a bit of experience by comparison. And Martinez brought in in 2019, I believe, to replace the outgoing Delict. But yeah, in my opinion, that's probably the biggest reason I'm not, not the biggest reason I'm excited about Eric Ten Hag, but a reason for me why he would be perfect for Manchester United, because you can see the long term, the, the longevity of it. All right. And now I'm under absolutely no illusions. And I've, I've gone on record saying this quite a few times now that Ten Hag can come in and wave the magic wand and do it all on his own. In a dream ideal world, I don't think this will happen. But in a dream world, the idea that we could get Ten Hag working there with Paul Mitchell controlling the transfers, with Ralph Ragnick helping consult at least or controlling part of what's going on with the football operations alongside John Murto, it seems dreamy. Yeah, it seems dreamy, but it seemed dreamy at the start when I said that Ralph Radnick could come in as interim manager. It was a smart choice. I didn't think United would make it, but we did make it. So why can't we make two more smart choices, in my opinion, and get Ten Hag and Paul Mitchell in? As I said, there are a lot of reasons why I think Ten Hag would be a perfect manager for Manchester United, but that rebuild from 2018 and 19 season through to 2021 and 22 and losing all those key, key players, arguably generational players in terms of the Ajax Academy. I just think that's so impressive. And for me, that goes to show that Ten Hag could not only come to Manchester United and be successful, but be successful over a sustained period of time. And that means not just building one team and then watching it fall apart. That's building a team, building successful. And even if a couple of players or a few players leave or a few players get older, having the ability to re-energize and rejuvenate and build that again in the same image a few years later, that's the cycle of success. That's what we haven't had at Manchester United. It's what Fergie did so well. And that, for me, is a big reason why I think the idea of Ten Hag team United, it just makes so much sense. That's my opinion, eh? I want to know what you think about that in the comments below. Do you think Ten Hag will be perfect? Do you think I'm going overboard when I'm saying about this ability to rebuild is, is a key characteristic? You let me know what you think in the comments below, as you always do. All right? And make sure you subscribe to United People's TV if you're new. And enjoy your weekend.